Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 82 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltak, and if you're watching this, as you can see, there's video, right? So this is the very, <laughs> the very first episode uh, that we're doing video for. I, I promised it to you, and it was one of the hardest promises I've ever tried to keep. I'm a day late, so I sort of didn't keep it, but um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm getting a little old, so it's very difficult to deal with a lot of this technology that I'm, uh, I'm trying to deal with, and yeah, it's been a real challenge, but here we are. So hopefully you like it, and it's... Uh, it's kind of fun to watch and inviting and all the rest of those uh, those things. And for those of you that are still just listening to it as a podcast, it's going to sound a little bit different. I'm kind of breaking into the technical details, but I kind of just want, it, want you to know what we're up against. I was having trouble with my mic. I've had to use a different mic, so it doesn't sound quite as good, but I'm working on it. Uh, but this is what we're going to have to roll with for our, um, our first uh, version of this. So anyway. Um, what I'm going to do is update you on a couple of things at the CCFR. Then I'm going to bring on Tracy Wilson. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Vortex, the power of optics. So to all of our friends over at Vortex Canada, we we truly appreciate uh, all of your help and uh, helping us keep this podcast rolling. So um, I got a couple of things I want to update you on. First one is our injunction. is uh, Our injunction hearing is coming up on January the 18th. And that's going to be kind of interesting. I did an interview with uh, Danielle Smith in Calgary this morning, where we talked about a couple of interesting things that are going on in connection with the injunction uh, application. One of those is that the government has decided, other than like I think two affidavits, they're not going to submit anything. They're really not. They're really not worried about proving anything, and they've uh, they've claimed cabinet confidence and sent us a 200-page document that just says we're not going to pro- be providing any evidence or any justification for our action of the gun ban, right? And, you know, Danielle was, um, it's amazing the how productive a conversation can be when both sides are interested in what the other has to say, right? This is, this is the way things used to work in Canada, but obviously that's been a challenge in the last decade or so. Uh, certainly it's a challenge now, but uh, I would encourage you to, to watch that, or sorry, listen to that interview. And I'll put a link in the description box of the video here on YouTube and also on Facebook and Twitter and wherever you'll, you'll see this, uh, podcast. If you are watching it, you'll see the the um, the link for that uh, that interview. And if you're still just listening to this podcast, uh, you will probably hear a little bit of a, a difference on the uh, the the sound quality. And the reason for that is I'm having trouble running all all of this uh, technology myself in real time and trying to make everything work. And I'm getting a little bit older; it's harder to learn things. Uh, so I have was having a little bit of trouble with my with my good mic, but we will struggle through. Uh, what else did I have on the agenda to chat about? Uh, episode five of Gun Ban Canada Exposed is uh, coming out here at the end of January. Make sure that you share these things. Uh, I, you know, it's amazing to me, and I, I know Tracy might mention something when I bring her on, is that that people still say, "Well, oh, I just saw, I, you know, I saw it. It's good, but you're preaching to the choir." They, I, it's weird because sometimes, and, and then we'll we'll post things like explainer videos, and like you know, people that have been with us a long time, a supporter will be like, "Oh, this is awesome." You know, I, you know, when did you guys make this? And, and I, maybe because I'm so close to all these projects, I, f- I forget that they exist too, but it's amazing to me how many people don't actually know about all the different things that we do. And one of the messages that seemed to, seems to keep getting lost is the CCFR makes this content like Gunband Canada Exposed. There's nothing ever been made like it, right? We make the content and you share it. So if, if you, I know if you've heard me say this, you know, 15 times, you're probably sick of hearing it because I'm certainly sick of saying it. If you haven't been sharing this material and sitting people down in your life to make them watch and listen to it and discuss it after, make sure that you do it because that's something I can't do. Something the CCFR can't do for you, right? So anyway, good thing to, uh, good thing to remember. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can get Tracy Wilson on, uh, on the Skype here. Let's, uh, let's check it out. Hey, Tracy. It's like magic. Here I am. (laughs) There you were. Awesome. Wilson. Okay. Um, You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing to be on video because now I can't just do whatever I want. I can't just show up how I normally look, which is unshaven, disheveled hair all over the place because I've been wearing a hat in a hoodie 
you know, it's a bit of a hassle to be honest with you. I don't have that same problem because I just look fabulous all the time. Just kidding. I'm sitting in my basement in a t-shirt. So was, welcome to pandemic life. I was, I was going to say that, but I, you know, um, uh, awesome. So we got quite a bit of stuff to cover, so we might as well get, get at it. Um, the first thing we'll talk about is you, uh, you did a radio interview for an American station, correct? Yeah, it was really cool. So this guy, Mike on Twitter, he got a hold of me and it was uh, mojo 50, <clears throat> is the name of the station. Now it's out of Dallas, Texas, but of course it airs all across uh, North America. Um, he's actually a Texan who's living in Alberta. So it's funny. He opens the show by saying he's broadcasting live from the 51st state. And uh, we had a little giggle about that, but it was great. He gave me lots of runway. I had 25 minutes to talk about, um, you know, all the, all the things that we're facing um, as far as the unfriendly liberal government and all the battles and really let me promote the CCFR. So it was a good, honest, awesome conversation. It was it was a lot of fun. I'll reshare the link around so everyone can get a chance to listen to it. So check out my social media later on this afternoon. Awesome. Um, now we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about a year in review, and it's a, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so yeah, let's, uh, I'm gonna. Try, yeah, yeah, we'll try to. I'm gonna get try and keep it, quick, it short, yeah. which for me is a big challenge because. You know, you know the way I get, but yeah, I'll, I'll try and just touch on these things quickly um, just to refresh them in people's memory and then we can move along. That sounds great. What's up first? All right. So we've got a couple of landmark history making cases as far as parliamentary e-petitions go. We started off the year with E2341, which was initiated by CCFR field officer Brad Manziak and sponsored by conservative MP Glenn Motts. It was sort of a preemptive you know, we don't we don't support gun ban type petitions. And at the time of its closing, it was the most signed e-petition in Canadian history. Right on the heels of that, we also had petition E2574, which was sponsored by Conservative MP Michelle Rempel. And um, it actually it not only broke records, it set records that I don't think will ever be beat or at least, you know, not not for some time. It closed. um in September with 230,905 signatures, which is leaps and bounds ahead of anything else. So, you know, for, for, uh, you know, gun control measures that apparently 80% of Canadians support, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, you can't get people to sign the anti-gun petitions and ours are just carried away. So yeah, those, those are pretty neat. Yeah. And, 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 and that's a, a common fallacy, right? And there's, Oh, this poll said mm -hmm. that Canadians want assault weapons banned. Well, I would imagine that if there was assault weapons all, of, all over the place, full autos, squad automatic weapons being shot in, in the streets, yeah, people would want them banned. But it's always misleading questions, and it's always to a public that really doesn't understand the issue in, in at all. And it's just always interesting, too, and I'll just put this in here real quick, is that it's if, if Canadians were so passionate, so passionate about gun control, you'd think that they would take two seconds to go online and, and you know, uh, put, their, put their name to a petition that costs them nothing, especially when it's advertised in Cineplex Odeon Theaters, which was free, by the, or not, not free, but uh, it was, the, it was the, uh, the Transit Authority in Toronto, I believe, that gave yeah. free bus bench advertising, free advertising on buses and, and mass transit to the anti-gunners to, to, to publicize their... their um, their petitions and also the doctors on their national days of, of action. You know, they're getting like, you know, 30 people and in some places three or four people, you know, where's all this, where's all the support, right? It's, it's political trickery as usual. Absolutely. We see it a lot. I mean, I think that everybody in our community needs to, um, you know, needs to also be a little more aware. And that leads me into the next item. So I traveled out to Saskatchewan last February to meet up with our friends at the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation. So we've entered into a partnership with them, um, an advocacy partnership. It bridges kind of a longstanding gap in advocacy between sports shooters and hunters. As we know, there's always sort of been you know, well, if it doesn't affect me, I'm not going to get involved type of attitude. And that's really is changing. And the, the CCFR is leading um, the charge on that. So I went out, I went to their annual convention, uh, February 20th to the 22nd of last year, solidified our partnership with them. They gave me an opportunity to speak and shake hands and meet with all the great hunters out in Saskatchewan. So little shout out to them for their 
just a friendly discourse out there in the West. Awesome. And what's next? Okay, so on top of all this, we also had a CPC leadership race going on. So the Conservatives were looking for a new leader after Andrew Scheer stepped down. Um, this was a little bit of a different race compared to the 2017 leadership race. There was only four candidates. So it was a great opportunity, you know, with COVID and everything so bizarre going on, we were able to host and broadcast live virtual town halls with all four CPC leadership candidates. This was this was a great opportunity to get them out in front of gun owners. We took questions from the audience. It was very interactive and it really helped gauge you know, their personal positions. I mean, there's party policy and then there's somebody's personal position on something. Um, of course, Aaron O'Toole won that uh, leadership race and is the current leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. And right after winning leadership, he appointed Shadow Minister for Public Safety, uh, Shannon Stubbs. Shannon and I, I was her literally her second meeting of her new appointment. She had a meeting with Bill Blair right after the appointment and then called me. So, we are off to a running start with Shannon. Um, she's a great advocate for the community, a great Alberta MP, and she really understands the issues. So things are chugging along pretty healthy there. Yeah, it's good. She's great. And um, I, 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 I empathize with having to listen to Bill Blair's rhetoric for any length of time. So good on you, Shannon. <laughs> right. Yeah, she's, she's doing a great job holding him to account on all parts of that massive file. Yeah. Um, speaking of massive file, of course, um, 2020 also saw the horrific rampage in Nova Scotia. So this was carried out by an unlicensed madman. He was known to law enforcement. He was disguised as law enforcement. There's a lot of really weird things coming out of that story, and it's still evolving to this day. And of course, 22 people lost their lives. Um, Bill Blair and Justin Trudeau used that opportunity of course, to come in with this sweeping gun ban on hundreds of thousands of Canadians that, that did nothing but follow the rules. So part of our reaction to that was we leapt into action. We completed over 68 interviews with mainstream media to bring awareness to Canadians about what this gun ban really means and how it doesn't actually affect people like the Nova Scotia killers. So yeah, that was really busy. That was a lot, like 68 interviews in a matter of three days between you and I. It was insane. Yeah, it's grueling. It's grueling. But it was grueling. Yeah. But after that happened and the and the gun ban took place, we we uh rather than commiserated with everyone, we rolled up our sleeves and we got to work. So what else do we get done? Well, <clears throat> speaking of things that have never happened in history before, you know, we've got some really great groups in Canada that sort of you know, just various voices of advocacy, I call them, that sort of, you know, have been doing their own jobs, working in their own silos. And I thought, you know what, we need to get together on a united front. Gun owners have been asking for that, and I intended to deliver it. So I spearheaded an initiative to gather the leaders from the CSSA, the CSAAA, which of course is the industry lobby group, the NFA and us here at the CCFR. And we all put out um, a message in solidarity demanding the resignation of Bill Blair. Now, we didn't leave it there. We actually went further and we gathered up literally hundreds of gun clubs, wildlife organizations, wildlife federations, hunting clubs, you know, anything you can imagine from all across the country. It was the largest, most coordinated cooperative response to um, to gun control that the country's ever seen. So that's, you know, I, I mean, did Bill Blair resign? No, of course not. But what it did do was, um, you know, it, it put a little spark under some of the organizations that may have been a little bit quieter on this. And at least we could stand together in solidarity. And, um, you know, honestly, if we saw more of that, that's exactly what the liberals don't want, right? We... We're stronger together, for sure. Well, the whole point is, you know, we tried to do this years ago um, mm -hmm. with another organization. And the point is not that, that that's going to that's gonna change anything per se, but it does, you know, put the government on notice. Like, oh, wait a second. These groups all usually fight yeah. against each other. This is bad. We haven't seen this before. They could all unite and, and all start working together. And that would be a big political force. And and I always saw value in that, but it's been um, an incredibly difficult thing to achieve. 
And I, you know, not that I'm, I'm trying to break my arm patting ourselves on, on the back, but it's like, well, you organized that, right? The CCFR was the, was yeah. the group that finally broke through. And, and I think, um, I think it was great for the other groups too, to go, you know, we can actually do this together. And it doesn't mean that we're giving in on whatever, whatever our ideological differences are. And I, 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 I can only hope that they saw the value in it and that we can do that more in the future. I hope so, because we know that our opponents on the other side of the table have no problem um, holding each other up and patting each other on the back. So, yeah, it, it's been a little bit of a weakness of this community um, for decades now. And I'm going to continue Well, we are going to continue to um, try and work on that. But in the meantime, you know, the the battle rages on. And that brings me on to the next topic is um, on the 26th of May, um, a couple weeks after the announcement of the sweeping gun ban by Bill Blair and Justin Trudeau, we filed the largest, most comprehensive federal court action on behalf of Canadian gun owners in the history of the country. So this isn't a court challenge where we're um, intervening on somebody else's action or fundraising for them. This is, we are the only organization that filed their own action. Um, it's huge. And of course it comes with that injunction that you um, that you spoke about, that was incredibly expensive. But to us here at the CCFR, we're not going to leave any avenue unexplored nor rock unturned. So we're going to try every single thing. We're going to fight this every step of the way. So it was important for us to do that. And um, I think in a recent podcast, or maybe it was in our Ask Me Anything um, the, of course, the expenses for this court action have already exceeded a million dollars. So this is all grassroots funded. It's got to continue. Quitting or or just allowing this to happen or rolling over is not an option. So we're going to keep at it. There's lots more to come. And of course, that injunction will be heard in 10 days. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. And and for, for, a, for a gun group to spend a million dollars, I don't think that's ever happened before. It's... You know, the community wanted a court case. We gave them a court case. Community wanted a charter challenge, which is where the, yeah. <laughs> which is the real expensive part and an injunction. Like the injunction was probably a hundred thousand dollars. And it's tough for me to, to, and I don't want to drag this on too long because we got still got a lot of stuff to talk about. It's tough for me to, to think about that amount of money and think about what, what else I could have done. Right. Cause we do TV and we do ad campaigns. We do all kinds of really great stuff, yeah. radio, radio ads and, um, but you know, as you said, we have to, we have to fight this using every avenue we can. And if people keep supporting us, which I'm hoping that they will, and they, they have supported us very well, um, we can take every possible action against the government so that when they do these things and you know, Hey, may, they may not care. They may be like, oh, I'm out of here in five years and six, seven years. I don't care. Or four years, which would be ideal, less than four years. But, you know, at least they know when they do these things, there will be a response, not a bunch of rhetoric online, not a bunch of claims of heavy lifting. There will be an actual response that 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 follows. So I don't know. Um, I I'm cognizant of cost, but um, but I think we're doing the right thing with this. And I think most people support us. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, uh, an action of this size and consequence requires real professionals. It requires uh, an entire team of experts in this. And yeah, and that costs money. It's just the way it goes. But that's not the only way we're fighting this. We also need to fight this in the public eye. And that brings me to our next point. And this has actually been a really busy year for TV, even though we didn't get, you know, we we finished season two of the CCFR's Canada Downrange. We got that online for everybody. It's a really great action-packed you know, look at the Canadian shooting sports and it gives a really positive image. However, with COVID and everything going on, we weren't able to film any events for this for this season. So we sort of switched our focus and you've been producing all kinds of documentary style TV shows. So we started off with Gun Ban Canada, part one and part two. And that's those two episodes, they were like, you know, TV specials type thing. They took a hard look at how the gun ban affects Canadians and explore why it fails to address the issues related to violence. We heard from all kinds of expert guests and had great conversation. It was a little bit of, you know, commiserating together. Um, but I, I think it was important for the community to get that out there. 
And then immediately following that, there was a one hour made for TV documentary that we partnered um, with called Broken Trust. And this delved into the abuse of democracy by the Liberal government and the broken trust experienced by Canadians from coast to coast in, you know, using this horrible tragedy from Nova Scotia in order to prop up um, a, a ban on legal gun owners that had nothing to do with it. So those um, those are really, really impactful. And then, um, of course, I'll skip ahead. We've got Gun Ban Canada exposed, like you said, season, or episode five will be out shortly. All of these can be found for free on our YouTube channel. Make sure you check them out, share them around. You know, we're, we're stuck here. Half the country's in lockdown or various stages of it. It's a really great time to sit down with your family and just say, you know, hey, let, let's have a look at this and let's have a, a critical conversation about it. It's also a great time to send it to those that you can't visit. So um, make sure you're using those those online tools because they're 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 perfect. Yeah. As I, as I said, we make that content. Stuff like that's never been made before. It's it's a tremendous amount of work. It's not cheap either. But I <laughs> I could go on all day about how much work it is because I, I feel like I took on more than yeah. more than I could actually do, but there's no turning back now. But we just we really need the community to step up and start sharing that stuff and, and making sure that the right people see it. Right. That's you guys have the power to do it. It's we don't have the power to do it. So. Yeah, that's it. They're tools for you. They really are. Yeah. So um, right after that, we actually embarked on a colossal advertising campaign. So not everybody's going to watch the TV channels that we were able to put this on or watch a link that you send them. So we also, <clears throat> excuse me, wanted to take our message um, right to people in print and online in digital form. And we brought um, out over 68, I think it was, full page mainstream media ads. Um, this investment was over a quarter million dollars. It's unrivaled in Canadian firearm advocacy history. And this saw us in newsprint and digital media all across the country for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. And it brought to light some of the other issues other than the unfairness and, you know, the broken trust and the abuse of democracy. It also talked a lot about, um, you know, property rights and, and the fact that you don't have any. And that that's a, a problem for, I think, all Canadians. Um, it's guns right now, but as always, gun owners are the canary in the coal mine and, you know, if they can, we've seen the limits they can put on what we thought we had as freedom. So, oh yeah, that's we're in, yeah. we're in free fall right now. But, oh yeah, you know, it's, and it's funny. It's if um, you know, I went over to our our friend's Twitter feed I don't know a couple of days ago, and <laughs> and they're on the fainting couch as usual. They're just they're always the victims. Yeah. They're always outraged and offended by everything. I mean, that's their strategy. It's it is what it yeah. is. But they, you know, I, I had said something about, um, you know, the trust in institutions are in free fall. And that's the fact they are because our institutions are acting in the most abhorrent behavior uh, with the most abhorrent behavior you can imagine. Right. And um, yeah, it's oh, it's, yeah, it's really tough. And, and gun owners are the first to lose their things because, you know, governments don't think people should have guns, you know, um, but no, but I, I yeah, I, I think differently. I think that slaves don't have guns. Citizens do, you know, apparently yeah, we're all in this together, sure. I thought. But anyway. Yeah, yeah well, I, I don't know. These are crazy times. Um, speaking of crazy times, here we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And what do we decide to do? Gather 5,000 Canadians and head down to downtown Ottawa. So this was the single largest in-person show of protest since the 1990s. Uh, it was called the Integrity March. We marched on Ottawa as a united voice. Um, and this was to uh, oppose the undemocratic gun ban and show Canadians who we really are. Um, we provided PPE and um, PPE and, um, and sanitizer. sanitizer. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> a sanitizer to everybody that was there. We had a cleanup crew of volunteers coming in behind us. They cleaned everything up. Um, as we went along, anything that may have been dropped by anybody, water bottles or tissues or whatever. And it was funny, some PPS guys were saying to me afterwards that we actually left Ottawa cleaner than we found it. So, um, yeah, big shout out to everybody that came. And of course, um, we there's been zero reports of any cases of COVID coming out of that. It, it was earlier in the, the pandemic. It was in September, but 
um, yeah, there's a great video that highlights that on our website. So make sure you check that out. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I'm making an, um, a, a critical, critical update and a whatever year in review sort of video as well. I'm, I'm trying to get that out, but I'm struggling with this stuff right now, right? One struggle at a time. Yeah. And, uh, but in there, I'm like, no garbage, no damage, no fighting, you know, no conflict, no outbreak. Like that's how exceptional gun owners are. It doesn't seem, it seems Absolutely. like we're the only group in the, you know, in society that can actually pull that off for some reason. I don't know why that is, but that's, that's how exceptional gun owners are. And, but again, you know, easy to, to vilify us for some reason. So the, the, the messaging, the vilification is the fantasy part and the reality is much, much different. But anyway, it was a great time and, and it was really great to, to, to see everybody, especially after everything that we've been through in Canada since, uh, since last February. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, regardless of whatever impact it had for everybody else, I think for the people who were there, you know, it did it did feel like being with family. And it is, you know, we've been kicked in the head um, all through the year by the liberals. Well, for the last five years. Right. So it um, yeah, it did feel good. And uh, I know there was some global reporters who were tweeting about it. They were looking out their windows uh, from up in their castles above the uh, streets of Ottawa. And they were talking about how it was, you know, between four to five to six thousand people. So, um, of course, it's hard to get a, an exact number because, you know, there's no way to count them, really. But I, I'd estimate between forty five hundred and five thousand people. Easily. You meant, meant eight hundred people is what they said. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. I'll, I'll say eight thousand. Yeah. But you know what? I don't I don't like to lie. So. I know yeah. these people are. Crazy. Yeah, it does never, never but, really gets yeah. anywhere. Although, you know what? Maybe I'm the stupid one. Seems to be, be getting a lot of people a lot of places. <laughs> so, all right. What uh, do we have anything else? Yeah. So during um, your Gun Ban Canada episode one, I think it was, or maybe it was Gun Ban Canada Ex Exposed episode one, we met Pete Merrifield, and he's the vice president of the National Police Federation. This is the union that represents over 20,000 frontline RCMP officers from across the country. And it was funny, we you interviewed him for the, sh for the show, and it was super impactful for me to, to watch him because... You know, we keep hearing that, well, the, you know, this will impact crime and law enforcement wants it. And no, no, they actually don't. In fact, they don't want it so badly that the police union um, got together. They spent I know how much it costs to put out those real press releases on the newswire, not web stories, but actual press releases. It's thousands of dollars. Um, and they came to Ottawa. They had a lobby week uh, with different um, parliamentarians, and they they're actually fighting the gun ban. So it was uh, really interesting to see the um, National Police Federation come out in opposition to this. And of course, uh, you know, a lot of people online, some of the anti-gun groups and whatnot, like to consider themselves experts. They're self-imposed experts. Um, I, I would like to think that the people out there who are trying to keep the, the streets and, and towns across this country safe, they really are the experts of what we need to do to combat actual crime. So big shout out to them. And that sort of that sort of rounded out the year. I mean, of course, there's a lot of other things that went on. I just wanted to bring some of the big points out front uh, to remind everybody you can find all of this on a post on the website at firearmrights.ca. Um, it's called 2020 in the rear view mirror and um, lots, lots more exciting things coming for the coming year. So well, you know, stay tuned. You know, what's interesting and I'm, I'm basically giving away all, all the video that I'm going to make, but um, what's interesting is aside from what Pete Merrifield and the national police federation did. And I think maybe one other thing, like all of that stuff that you just talked about, the CCFR did in eight months, we did all of that since yeah. May 1st of this past year. Right. It is a tremendous, yeah. tremendous amount of work. And um, and yeah, I just if 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 the if the community continues to support us the way they have supported us, which is enable us to do all that stuff like we could not do that unless people are supporting us by being members or donating or whatever. Right. But if they can continue, there's a lot more of that on the horizon. So anyway, I really appreciate uh, you giving us that update. And um, yeah, it was uh, it's quite entertaining, I think. I think so too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks a lot, Ron. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode of the CCFR radio podcast, episode 82, the very first one that is uh, in on video. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. It's going to get a lot better after this. Um, I just need more time to, to work out the kinks again. I just want to say thank you to everybody for your support. I hope you're pleased with the work that we're doing and, and the volume of work we're doing. We're doing everything we can, again, probably for selfish reasons. I just don't want to lose my guns, and certainly not for no reason. Uh, but again, I just, yeah, I, I really appreciate the trust that all of you have in us uh, to, to do everything we can to save our guns. So if you want to become a member, I'd really greatly appreciate it. You can do that by going to firearmrights.ca. If you want to donate, that's a great way to do it too. And if you want to donate directly to our legal trust uh, so that the money goes directly to uh, to our legal expenses uh, for our lawsuit and our injunction, then you can go to firearmrights.ca, click the legal link. You'll see it in the upper right-hand corner, and you can donate there. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're uh, not watching the video, uh, make sure you share this podcast. Take care, and we'll see you soon. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.